Hello and welcome to video number 14 in the OHA workup series. In this video series called Big Lies, the church believes, taken from chapter 6 of OHA, I'll be debunking several big lies that Satan, the father of lies, has gotten us to believe that have no, not only resulted in numerous Christian casualties on the battlefield of life, but have tragically and virtually nullified our impact in the culture for Christ. All of these big lies are the direct result of decades of false teaching from false teachers whose lies are now in every institution in America from our house to the White House. As we saw in the beginning with Adam and Eve, Satan piggybacks into our lives on top of lies. If he can get us to accept his lies as our truth, he's got us. The only power that Satan has over us is the power that we give him. We give him that power when we accept his lies as our truth. If we want to live victorious lives and reclaim territory for the kingdom of God from the kingdom of darkness, it's critical that we expose and demolish his lies. In our last video, part one of the big lies that the church believes, I discussed the big lie that prosperity theology is biblical theology. If you missed this, you definitely want to check it out. In this video segment, part two of Big Lies the Church Believes, titled Stop Judging Me, I will debunk the big lie that we're not supposed to judge. If you're meeting me for the first time, my name is James. I'm the president of Operation Heal America, a kingdom company dedicated to unleashing spiritual healing and revival from our house to the White House through obedience to 2 Chronicles 7.14 for the advancement of God's kingdom and the magnification of his glory worldwide. The purpose of this workup series, as I've said all along, is to highlight and uncover the magnitude of the spiritual crisis in America today so we, the church, can fully address the solution in Operation Heal America, which is the first ever frontline national plan centered on 2 Chronicles 714, to God be the glory. In this video, I'll be discussing the religious mantra around the big lie that we're not supposed to judge, the most common Bible verse taken out of context by Christians to support the false belief that we're not supposed to judge, what the Bible really says about judgment the conditions necessary for biblical judgment, how the enemy has used this big lie to keep us trapped in our sins and entangled with the yoke of slavery, the proper way to judge, and finally, why it's necessary to render biblical judgments. Disclaimer, the sources for the information contained in this video, where applicable, may be found in Operation Heal America. So let's get into it. The next big lie that Satan has gotten many of us to believe to destroy every institution in America from our house to the White House is that we're not supposed to judge. The unspoken religious mantra goes something like this. Everybody should keep quiet about everyone else's sin because we're not supposed to judge. The famous verse that Christians love to quote out of context to support this big lie comes from Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 7. Quote, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Matthew 7 verses 1 through 3. No, nowhere in this passage of scripture does it say don't judge, period. It says if you're going to judge someone in a particular area, you better be living right in that area yourself because the same judgment you render out is coming back to you. I like to call that the boomerang effect. Christ's words specifically deal with hypocritical judgment. That is judging others for the same sin that we have in our lives. Another translation of the same verse, which makes it even more clear, says it this way. Listen to this. So why do you see a piece of sawdust in your brother's eye and not notice the wooden beam in your own eye? How can you say to another believer, let me take the piece of sawdust out of your eye when you have a wooden beam in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, remove the beam from your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the piece of sawdust from another believer's eye, Matthew 7, 3 through 5. 
I like this translation better because sawdust is produced from wood and so is a wooden beam. Thus, we're not talking about two different sins that the one doing the judging and the one being judged are engaging in. We're talking about varying degrees of the same sin. That is a little speck of wood in the eye of the one being judged versus a wooden beam in the eye of the one doing the judging. Said another way, we could say, why do you see the speck of sin X in your brother's life and not notice the beam of sin X in your own life? Or by way of a real life example, why do you judge someone for their porn addiction when you produce pornographic videos for profit? In other words, before you lovingly confront someone else about their porn addiction, i.e. render a judgment, deal with your own porn addiction. Got it? We see this concept again in Romans chapter 1. Here Paul has just finished describing the fate of the unbelieving pagan Gentiles and in Romans 2 has moved on to admonish God's people regarding hypocritical judgment. Listen to the following. Quote, therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Romans chapter two, verse one. You tell others not to steal, i.e. render a judgment on those who steal. But do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery, i.e. render a judgment on those who commit adultery. But do you do it? You condemn idolatry, i.e. render a judgment on those who commit idolatry. But do you steal from pagan temples? Romans 2, verses 21 to 22. Another great example of hypocritical judgment found in Scripture that many Christians love to quote to support the big lie that we're not supposed to judge may be seen in John chapter 8, when Jesus encountered the woman about to be stoned to death by her accusers. According to Mosaic law, before someone could stone another person to death for adultery, two critical elements had to be satisfied, none of which were present in this encounter between Jesus and the woman at the, about to be stoned to death by her accusers for adultery. First, both the man and the woman had to be brought before their accusers, Deuteronomy 22, verses 22 to 24, to prevent false allegations. It's a little hard to commit adultery by yourself, wouldn't you agree? If the woman was caught in the act of adultery, then her accusers must have known who the man was, right? So where was he? This violation of Jewish law alone would have precluded her from being stoned. Certainly, Jesus could have exposed this, but he didn't. Have you ever wondered why? While the Bible doesn't say, I can't help but think that Jesus kept quiet to let the hypocritical drama build for what he was about to do and about to say. Secondly, Mosaic law required that the stone thrower could not be guilty of the same type of offense as the stone receiver. If the stone thrower was guilty of a similar offense as the stone receiver, then after the stone receiver was stoned to death, the stone thrower would have to get into the quarry. While the Bible doesn't say what Jesus wrote in the sand during those divinely orchestrated moments of silence, which probably seemed like an eternity to the religious teachers and Pharisees who knew they had not met the requirements of Jewish law. We do know that as they continued to question Jesus about what should be done to her, Jesus stood up and publicly declared, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. John 8, verse 7. Jesus did not mean you who have never committed any sin cast the first stone. Otherwise, a judgment could never be rendered on any issue at any time. He meant you who, were, who are without any notorious sin, having committed a similar scandalous sin, and particularly this sin of adultery cast the first stone. I hope you can now see that this scripture has been grossly misinterpreted and misused by many pastors and Christians to this day to turn the tables on those who are lovingly and non-hypocritically confronting them with their sin so that these same pastors and Christians in many cases can continue unchallenged in their persistent, unrepentant, 
sinful lifestyles. Jesus did not mean you who have never committed any sin cast the first stone. Otherwise, a judgment once again could never be rendered on any issue at any time. You see, Jesus knew where the boys had been and what they had been up to. He was exposing their hypocrisy, not to mention their self-righteous and hypocritical breach of Jewish law that precluded them from stoning her to death. God's word tells us over and over again that it is not only proper to judge, but that it's our responsibility to judge as long as we do so correctly and righteously, i.e. not hypocritically. Here are a just a few passages of scripture among many others to support this. Listen. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. Psalm 37:30. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of my mouth. Psalm 119, 13. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Proverbs 31, verse 9. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now, thou son of man, wilt thou judge? Will thou judge the bloody city? Yea, thou shalt show her all of her abominations. Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one or wrongly judged by everyone. 1 Corinthians 2, 15. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you not worthy to judge the smallest of matters? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. For I indeed, as present in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has done this deed. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 3 and 4. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning in these ways. God will judge those on the outside. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 12 and 13. The king speaks with divine wisdom. He must never judge unfairly. Proverbs 16.10. For it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? 1 Peter 4, 17. For if the correct time for circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it so as to not break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath? Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. John chapter 7, verses 23 to 24. And this next and final one is the context from which a certain money lender, if you recall, had two debtors, one with a debt of 500 denarii and another with a debt of 50 denarii, to which the money lender intended to cancel the debt, and Jesus asked Simon Peter, who do you think Simon Peter would be more grateful to have their debt forgiven? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged correctly, Luke 7, 43. So as you can see, even Jesus himself acknowledges the, the importance of rendering proper, righteous judgments. According to Webster, to judge means to discern, to distinguish, to form an opinion of, to compare facts or ideas, to distinguish truth from falsehood. Therefore, when you say your neighbor is a good person and that a drug lord or terrorist is an evil person, you are rendering a judgment. Someone with the gift of discernment has been given the gift of judging someone or a situation correctly and biblically. Just imagine if we were not supposed to judge. There would be no need for pulpits, prophets. Prisons, probation, lawyers, courts, law enforcement, or the military. 
You couldn't discipline your children or lovingly challenge their decisions. You couldn't tell your 12-year-old daughter to stop pursuing a romantic relationship with a 19-year-old boy and vice versa. You couldn't discipline your children for willfully defiant behavior. Failing students could advance to the next grade. Colleges would have to accept anyone who applied. You couldn't vote in any election. You'd have to marry the first person who asked you regardless of their character or whether or not you liked them or were attracted to them. An employer would have to hire every applicant that applied. False teaching would be allowed to run rampant in the church. Immoral laws could not be reversed. Church leaders would have to step down or wouldn't have to step down for sexual sin. There would be no need for accountability groups. The United States could not place economic sanctions on countries like Iran and North Korea, and we could not impose tariffs on Chinese goods coming into America to level the playing field. The list is endless. I trust you get the idea. Pretty silly, right? Yet this is precisely what so many Christians believe, declaring, you know, brother, you're not supposed to judge. Give me a break. Just stop and think about all the judgments we made in just the last 24 hours. It would take most of us another 24 hours to list them. This big lie has even weaved its way into the gay marriage debate among Christians. To not appear judgmental, well-meaning Christians say something like this. Well, if that's what they want to do behind closed doors, that's their business. Or it's not for me to judge someone else. Besides kicking God's truth to the curb where he has declared homosexuality to be an abomination, Leviticus 18.22, despite his love for the homosexual, they commit idolatry by elevating their word above God's word on the matter. Oh, you need a New Testament example? On God's view on homosexuality, did the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, also have it wrong in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 to 10, and 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 10? God has clearly spoken on the subject of homosexuality and on many other issues, beloved, and he didn't stutter. He expects us to do the same thing lovingly, respectfully, clearly and unapologetically on all matters of sin. This requires correct, righteous, non-hypocritical judgments. I love what this author, John Duncan, has to say about the big lie that we're not supposed to judge. Listen to this. It's really good. The devil has been successful to push push the church further and further into a corner while everyone else comes out of the closet with their sins. Most often, Those who tell you, quote, not to judge them do so because they are either hiding something themselves or want to continue doing it without reaping negative effects for it. In the campuses where we have been, students say that we shouldn't judge or form an opinion of fornicators, drunkards, liars, homosexuals, or the like. However, they fail to realize that sin harms them and their neighbors. A caring, loving Christian will judge all situations according to the word of God and call sinners to repentance. The church has become intimidated by the opinions of the world as they, the world, scream, you religious bigots, hate mongers, and intolerant people, which incidentally are judgments in themselves. Do not judge me. However, God clearly commands us to judge so we won't be deceived. Obviously, if the church stops judging and uses and using our common sense, we will no longer be able to distinguish good from evil. We will buy into the politically correct idea of moral relativism and we will bow down to the devil's wishes to deceive us, our family and our nation. Even more disturbing is to see church leadership saying Don't judge. Many pastors lead their sheep astray and keep them under their manipulative control by telling them that they have a critical spirit or they're prideful or judgmental, while all they, the sheep, are trying to do is to discern the truth. If you find yourself in such a church, flee for your life, unquote. 
Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18, is all about the church rendering proper judgments. In this case, when one believer sins against another believer. Notice how many judgments are rendered here. Let's take a look at it together. Quote, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the fault, i.e. render a judgment. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back, i.e. by correctly judging them. But if you are un unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that you may collectively render a judgment so that everything you say may be confirmed or judged by two or three witnesses who will render their judgments. If that person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. If the church decides you are right by rendering a corporate judgment, but the other person won't accept it, treat them as a pagan or as a corrupt tax collector, i.e. judge them in this manner. Whatever you prohibit on earth by way of judgment is prohibited in heaven by way of judgment. And whatever you allow on earth by way of judgment is allowed in heaven by way of judgment. Matthew 18, 15 through 18. This also means that we should listen to others when they render proper righteous judgments against us because we have sinned against them. This requires humility. If we love God, we should want to confess our sins, turn from our wicked ways, i.e. repent, and be restored unto God and one another. So it goes both ways, right? Finally, it's critical to remember that even when judgment is proper and righteous, there is a correct way to do it and an incorrect way to do it. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul tells us the correct way to do it. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Matthew says that we should judge others in the same way that we would want to be judged. Matthew 7, verse 12. Ephesians 4, 15 says, Speak the truth in love, becoming in every way like Christ. A critical point to remember in any discussion on rendering biblical judgments on others or they on us that I hope you picked up on in this video is the following. While Christians are called to render righteous, non-hypocritical judgments against sin, we are not called to judge another's preferences, i.e. meet, no meet, college, no college, stay single, get married, rent, or own, eat Chinese food with a fork or chopsticks. Now, let's conclude with a question on a very controversial topic based on what you've learned from this video. Is it unbiblical, wrong, or sinful for one Christian to render a correct non-hypocritical judgment on another Christian publicly by name as a warning to others of those who are engaging in such evils as blasphemy, false teaching, and or idolatry in order to protect others from being led astray? Well, if you do believe it's wrong or unbiblical, I don't recommend you telling that to the Apostle Paul when you see him on the other side. Let's take a look. Let God be true and every man a liar. Romans 3, verse 4. In 1 Timothy 1, Paul opens the letter by reiterating the reason why he left Timothy in Ephesus, to stop the work of false teachers. Paul is encouraging and instructing Timothy to beware beware and be mindful of false teachers and to those who misuse the law and to fight the good fight, having faith and a good conscience in keeping with the prophecies previously made about Timothy. Paul warns Timothy of those who have rejected these prophecies and shipwrecked their faith. Here's the passage of scripture, quote, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, 
of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the aged Paul declares to Timothy that the time for his departure is close at hand. In his final instructions to Timothy, he, Paul, tells Timothy that he has been deserted by faithful companions and co-laborers in the ministry, some for noble reasons, others not. Paul publicly singles out one by name who deserted him, quote, because he loved the world. Listen to the applicable passage, quote, do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Then, just four verses later, Paul renders another public judgment by name against Alexander the coppersmith, who many theologians believe to be the same Alexander I referred to just moments ago. Listen to the following. Quote, Alexander the coppersmith did me harm, great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. In my last video, you may recall that I too called out by name many false teachers in our day who were engaging in prosperity theology and leading millions of Christians astray. I'm not the only one doing it, thank God. For those of you who formerly had a problem with it, I hope you can now see that it is not only biblical, but necessary as a warning to false teachers who need to repent and to Christians who need to know who these false teachers are so they can break away from them and yes, take their money with them false teachers and no longer be led astray. Thus, in an effort to obliterate the big lie that we're not supposed to judge, the truth is God expects his people to judge correctly and righteously, i.e. non-hypocritically. And if we don't, God will judge us for not doing so on Judgment Day. This concludes part two of the big lies that the church believes. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe for upcoming releases. Tell your family, friends, relatives, and most of all, your pastors. In our next release, part three, I'll cover another big lie the church believes from chapter six of OHA, which is that the demonstration of the gospel eliminates the need for proclamation of the gospel. You don't want to miss this. Pastors, friendly reminder, OHA year two execution begins on January 1st, 2023. No worries if you missed year one. I made it real easy for you to plug in at any time. Everything you need is at our website, OperationHealAmerica.com. Don't forget to register today at our website. The book is free to you and registration is free. If you would like to meet or speak with me, pastors, please contact me at our website so we can make those arrangements. Happy to do that. Brothers and sisters, thank you once again. Please have your pastors register at our website, OperationHealAmerica.com, or contact me there if they have any questions. Friendly reminder, once again, free copies of the book are available to not only every pastor, but disabled vets and anyone who can't afford a copy, reach out to me at our website, and I'm happy to send you one. Let's pray. Now unto him who was able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And God's people said, Amen. And amen. We'll see you next time. God bless.